Hey 104, we're going over chapter 22 today. This is health, assessing health status. This is a big chapter because we base everything off of our assessment skills and our head to toe assessment in nursing. Um, I want, I'm hoping that with this PowerPoint, you're gonna hear it and maybe it's gonna imprint a little faster as well as hear the terminology that we're gonna be using because that's gonna take a while to start uh, catching on to the terminology and how we say it. So we're going to learn normal, but then you also have to know what is abnormal. And that will come with experience and time. So here we go. Assessment, data collection. We are constantly assessing as nurses. Um, and assessing is just a, is observing and we'll go through the skills and it's also collecting data on your patient. On admission, we're getting a detailed assessment, so it's gonna include everything. The, the head-to-toe assessment, so that physical examination. We're gonna go into the, the history, the medical history of the patient, demographic, anything that is pertinent to daily care or that would affect care. So we have a lot of cultural is gonna be in this as well. And current health problems, and then how long they've been going on. So that's on admission, and then you've got a focal assessment every six, um, next shift at the beginning of that shift. Now, this is also gonna depend on where you work as to how that is supposed to go. Is it every four hours, eight hours? So, but that's the gist of the concept of it. All right, so we need to look at the whole patient. I know we've talked about that before, but we're looking at what makes the patient the patient. So we're always gonna also be looking for cultural preferences and health beliefs. And I'm gonna throw this therapeutic statement out there. Tell me about, or can you tell me about anything I need to know to help me care for you better? You could throw in there about cultural or health, but if they, like, if they say they're Jewish, don't just assume they're kosher. We need to get that open-ended conversation going and treat them as an individual, not as a group. Um, don't forget about your cultural preferences for nutrition, that's a big one. Um, bathing, personal care, it may not be the same way as yours is, so we need to know what they want. Also, what their perception of their illness is and the treatment, and then who should we talk to about their decisions? It may not be the patient, and we go into that more in chapter, I believe it's 15 with culture, or 14. Um, don't just assume and f uh, that they're just, that they believe what another group believes. They may call themselves Catholic, but that doesn't mean they believe everything that every Catholic does. Um, they are an individual. Phrase your questions in a positive, non-threatening way. Um, so you want it to sound like you just wanna get info to help them versus you're there to judge them or interrogate them about that side of them. That admission assessments, we need to know social data, marital status, occupation, any type of sensory deficits, dentures, um, any prosthetics, uh, hearing aids, so allergies, big one, don't forget your allergies, any medications they've been taking, so that's over-the-counter herbs, prescribed meds. So when you're starting to go down and do your head-to-toe assessment, as you get more skilled with it, you can, um, like if you're down in the abdomen and you ask them, are you nauseous or have you been constipated? If they say yes or no, or sometimes you can always say, well, do you take anything at home for that? And now we just added more meds that they forgot to tell us because they may not think of, oh yeah, I take Tylenol or ibuprofen for a headache a couple times a week. So we can use that head to toe assessment to also see what they've been taking and how they've been managing their health status at home. So any diets, what do they follow at, at home? Are there any limitations, special foods? Culture is going to be a big one in this diet as well. Smoking, did they smoke before? When did they quit? How many packs per day? When they were smoking or currently? Um, we're also now starting to add in there, do they chew tobacco? Because we still need to know about that nicotine and as well as the whole aspect of that that mouth care with that any the use of alcohol how much what do they drink activities of daily living how do they care for themselves any past surgeries 
all health problems, current and past, and then why they're here now. Also look at the um, level of physical fitness, their independence, range of motion, stuff like that. Physical data. So we are going, when we do this head to toe assessment, we are going down from the head to the toes. We're also looking at the gait, the walking, the extremities, skeletal system, endocrine system, etc. All right, so the physical assessment it is a complete picture of the physiological functioning. It's super comprehensive and in-depth. So again, every system of the body, we need to know. And we need to know right away, too, because we want a baseline on our patient so we know when things start to change. If you don't do your assessment for six hours, how do you know if something changed or what's going on? All right, so one of the techniques here is inspection and observation. Those go in together. So this is hands off. We are looking, looking at things and observing and noticing and inspecting with our eyes. So general appearance, contours of the body, the skin, um, color, rashes, scars, lesions, diaphoresis, so sweating, ecchymosis, bruising, arrhythmia, redness. Um, please look these vocab words up in your book. That's what's going to help you with this head-to-toe assessment is you have to know the terminology and what you're looking for. You probably you look at your skin all the time every day, but you don't in your head analyze what you're actually doing and what you're looking at. But if you saw your hand was red, you'd be, oh, my hand's red. So start reading and getting that terminology in your head. Okay, so when we walk in on a patient, there are so many things that we can see right off the bat. General appearance, posture, are they disheveled, are they put together, are they look, where's the eye contact, are they attentive, are they following commands if you ask them to do something. So a lot of things when you walk in, you can get a whole list of like 20 things that when you walk in on that patient, their speech, um, how quick are they to respond to you. Are they friendly? Do they seem anxious? Are they angry? Guarding, do they look like they're in pain? So how can we make them feel more comfortable? Lots of different things we can do. Make sure, well, the big one, make sure they're draped or covered to uh, for modesty purposes with whatever area you're not working with. Also, just sit down and talk to them. Take Take a few minutes to sit down and talk with them. Get on their level. Don't stand and hover above them. Um, and be aware of the cultural or religious beliefs. So watch your eye contact, your proximity, body proximity, how close you get to them. Are you supposed to address another member of their family and not the patient? Uh, would there be any gender issues with the nursing or the healthcare staff? So palpation, this is using your hands and fingers. Okay, so what do you do if a patient cries out in pain when you palpate their abdomen? Well, the first thing I'll tell you is that I wouldn't keep poking there. <laughs> um, so I would stop poking. I wouldn't stop my full assessment and go call the doctor, but I would stop poking. I would ask the patient some more questions, like if they felt that at home or if they felt that before. What does it feel like? How bad was it from a scale of 1 to 10? I'd feel other areas, not the one that they said. See if there's other areas that are tender. So I would discontinue palpating in that area, but I'd continue along with my assessment, but that is something you would need to tell the doctor and let them know about. Auscultation. So this is listening with a stethoscope. Now we could be listening for sounds, but also we're going to be listening for where sounds should be and if they're not, and then how much of them are there. So the auscultation is going to be mainly for our lung sounds, and that's where you're using the diaphragm, which is the bigger side of your stethoscope. Um, heart sounds. So we're going to use the diaphragm for the normal S1, S2, and to count heart rate. And we'll use the bell, the smaller side, for abnormal heart sounds. So we're also going to go along those valve areas and listen with the bell. 
can also hear th uh, things such as bruise, which would be like a, a swishing in an artery. And also the abdomen, we're listening for bowel sounds, and that we are going to be using the diaphragm. So how long do you listen for bowel sounds? Okay, well, that depends. So here's our terminology with the abdomen. We've got, if they're between 5 to 30 per minute, that's going to be normal or present. It depends on your charting and your facility as to how they're going to phrase that, but it's the same concept, normal or present. So more than that, more than 30 a minute is going to be hyperactive. Less than 5 a minute is going to be hypoactive. In that 5, it also depends on the textbook that you have. Um, so it might be less than 10 a minute. But um, now, if you don't hear anything that's usually called absent, if you don't hear anything, you have to listen five minutes per quadrant. So we have four quadrants of the abdomen, the right lower, right upper, left upper, left lower. You would be listening to five minutes each quadrant you don't hear bowel sounds in for a total of 20 minutes before you can say it's absent. And what I would tell you is if you find them absent in bedside nursing, I would probably have another nurse double check because sometimes other nurses will be able to hear and you can't or your stethoscope might not be able to pick up as much. Um, there is a sequence you listen to the abdomen. It's going to be the right lower, right upper, left upper, left lower. And that has to do with the movement of the bowels. The other thing I want you to note is that each quadrant could have a different type of bowel sound in it. So your left lower could be hyperactive. Your left upper could be hypoactive. So treat them as individual. And don't just get in the habit of saying all four. It, it depends on what's going on. And then I do want to talk about this real quick. When you use the stethoscope, you're going to place the earpieces in your ears so they point forward towards the nose. So when you hold your stethoscope, you'll see the earpieces have a little curve to them. You want that curve to put to point forward to the nose so the sound to go slightly forward. And that's how you're going to put the stethoscope on. Okay, we, we do use our nose. We smell things. Um, breath, sweetness, acetone, al or alcohol smells, wound odors, and odors from other areas. So... Um, we would describe it, so if it's foul, it's a foul odor. Uh, it could be a sweet odor, it could smell of alcohol. So basic physical examination. Height and weight, we want those without shoes if at all possible. If you have an infant, we want them without the diaper. Do not leave unattended because they're going to be up on a counter uh, sitting in a scale. Vital signs, so don't forget about all your vital signs. That's part of your head to toe assessment. And I really would get that at the beginning. Um, I wouldn't be getting them at that body part. I would get my vital signs and then go into my head to toe assessment. Then we're going to go through our review of our body systems head to toe. So, head and neck, general appearance, appearance of the eyes, condition of the hair. So any, uh, you're going to feel the scalp, so are there any bugs in the hair, any lesions, bumps, and I said bumps, masses, something that doesn't feel the same on each side, so asymmetrical, any tenderness, um, dandruff, dry, condition of the hair, is it even or are there patches where there's no hair, the eyes look at the coloring, is the white Eyes, does, is, is, um, do they look the same, equal, sy symmetrical? Any difficulty in hearing or seeing? So we're gonna, now we're going to look at Perla. So pupils equal, round, reactive to light and accommodation. So P-E-R-R-L-A. So pupils are the equal in size. We measure them in mil millimeters. And this is when the light is normal. This is not when the lights are super dim or super bright because that's going to not be an accurate measurement. Are they both round? Are they, are they reactive to light? So when you shine the light in them, the pupils should constrict. And then when you take the light away, they should dilate. So a couple things we're going to be looking at with this. Um, 
the speed of the constriction, so getting smaller, so how quickly, is it brisk or sluggish? Um, your classmates, when you do it, you'll most likely see brisk. It's hard to explain a sluggish till you see one, but you'll know when you have a sluggish pupil. It's gonna, you're gonna shine the light and it's gonna either delay and then constrict or it's gonna constrict very slowly. Um, the reason constriction happens is the light, like if you walk into a really bright room and it hurts your eyes, it's because your pupils were open letting more light in. So the pupils constrict to not let as much light in so it doesn't hurt your eyes. So when it's dim or dark, we can't see as well, so the pupils dilate and get bigger to let more light in so you can see better. So if you're in a room and all of a sudden we flip the lights off, there's, you know when your eyes start to adjust that period and then you can start to see, that is actually the dilation of the pupils to let more light in so you're able to see better in the dark. Um, are the corneas clear or is there opac opacity? So are they cloudy? We might be looking at a, car um, a uh, cataract. And then accommodation, we'll go over that in class, but please read that in your book. And I know we did that with our head to toe assessment as well. All right, um, what I am gonna do is I'm gonna throw in here neck, because we didn't go into neck yet, but um, so neck. So we could have them shrug the shoulders to look at the strength of the shoulders. Um, you can look at the trachea right in the middle. Is it midline? Do you see, is it off to, off to the side or anything like that? See a big lump there, or goiter, th thyroid issue going on. Um, you're also gonna feel the carotids for the pulses, one at a time, because if you do both at the same time, you're blocking off blood flow to the brain. That is not good. Uh, we'll go into pulses a little more, but we're, we're looking for the, the strength of them and the regularity. So now going on down to the neck, we're going to be doing chest, heart, and lungs. So is the chest symmetric, shoulders equal height? Any spinal curvature, so lor lordosis is going to be um, forward curve of the lumbar spine. So uh, like, so pregnant women, you'll see this sometimes with that sway back because of the belly being so big and forward. That's lordosis. Kyphosis, with the H in it, is the hunchback. So the upper, upper thoracic area, cervical area. Or scoliosis, so S like a snake, so curving of the spine on uh, that plane. Any signs of dyspnea, dis difficulty breathing, are they in, um, are they leaning forward trying, struggling to breathe? Are they using accessory muscles? So you're seeing a lot of work going into their breathing. Is it labored, non-labored? Um... So then you can feel for the PMI, point of maximum impulse. So this is left midclavicular, fifth intercostal space, the PMI. This is also the mitral valve, the bicuspid valve, and the apex of the heart. Those are all in the same spot. So can you feel that point of maximum impulse? Sometimes can you see it? So then we're going to listen to heart sounds. Now if you want to listen to lung sounds first, that's totally up to you. We're just going down through this slide. So heart sounds normal, so we're listening for the S1, S2, the lub dub. But now at this point, because you know they're S1, S2, I, no more lub dub, it's S1, S2. So we're going to be listening to five points of the heart. We're going to be listening to the aortic valve, pulmonic valve, the second pulmonic, which is also known as herbs point, tricuspid, and then the mitral or the apex, apical that we just talked about. So we're gonna be looking at a diagram of that, but you're gonna go through with the diaphragm and listen for the S1, S2 at all five points. And then you're gonna go back through with your bell and you're gonna be listening to the abnormal. It, well, hopefully there aren't abnormal, but listen for abnormal sounds. So extra sounds, galloping, which could be an S3 or S4, or murmurs, like a gurgling or um, turbulent flow of blood. And a mnemonic to remember those points is a pig eats too much. So A, P, E, T, M. A pig eats too much. So the aortic, pulmonic, herbs, or the second pulmonic, tricuspid, mitral. Lung sounds. All right, so you we're going to use a diaphragm here. So you see those points. Um, we're going to go to the next slide that's going to show the points of where we're listening to. But we're going to be comparing each side. 
So we're going to do like a, a Jacob's Ladder or like a snake type pattern when we're listening. Um, so please go in your book over the adventitious sounds. So it's adventitious sounds. So that means abnormal breath sounds. But now you have to know how to describe them. Now these are going to be uh, difficult in the sense of you haven't heard them yet. But you can at least memorize the, the word of them and the meaning of the word. Um, so wheezing, a high-pitched sound. So go through your book and look at those abnormal lung sounds like ronchi, strider. It's just more of an upper airway, but still it's, it's included in there. Uh, ronchi, wheezing, crackles, diminished. So go through those. Also, in your patient's breathing, you want to you want to put your hands around the, their back ribs and feel how the chest expands. Is it is it symmetrical? Is it even? Okay, so here are the points. So we're gonna um, you can start whichever side you want, but we're gonna start at one. So we would go from the one to the other one, and then we're gonna go down on the same side. So if we start over at the left, we'll go left one, right one. Then we would go to right two, left two, then left three, right three, right four, left four, left five, right five. So that's the anterior of the chest. So we're going to be listening to inhalation and expiration, expiration for each point. So they're going to go, and then we'll move to the next point. And compare them because different lobes of the lungs are going to be different. Um, and I do want to tell you this. So the right side of the lung has three lobes and the left side has two. It's because the heart is on the left. So here's your posterior. Now this kind of shows you more the direction to go down in there. So that's the posterior points of the lung. And if you note, they're going around the scapula, the shoulder, bl shoulder blade. We can't really hear well through that big bone. So now with the skin assessment, you, you are assessing the skin the entire way down, not just here. So you're always, always assessing skin wherever you are. Um, we talked about a few of these already. So capillary refill, this is where you push down on the nail bed. You look for the blanching. So it's where it turns pale or white. And then you let go and you should see that color refill less than three seconds. Now this depends on the book. Some books say less than two, some say less than three. Facilities, it depends on the facility you work at. So you need to know that. Um, now, if it's initially, if you get less, if you get five seconds, what I would do is I would try another nail and try it again. Um, I am gonna throw this out there that the, sometimes the elderly, it's considered normal for five seconds for the elderly, but that depends on the book. But traditionally, it's our less than three second color refill. Assess peripheral pulses. So we got temporal, carotid, brachial, radial, femoral, popliteal, posterior tibialis, and dorsalis pedis. Those are your pulses. We've gone over those. Um, so for each one of them, you are assessing for regularity and strength. So we either absent, which if they're absent, that's we need to go get a Doppler and listen to them, and we'll go over that in class. Um, plus one is weak, plus two is normal, or, yeah, normal. Um, three is pretty strong, and four is bounding, which is you could see it off the skin. So now what I would do is I wouldn't just go through all my pulses. I would be doing them where I am. So if I'm at the head, I'd feel the temporal. Down to the neck, feel the carotids. When I'm doing the extremities, I'll get those. When I go down towards the perineal area, I'll get the femoral, etc. And last thing, other than the carotids, doing one at a time, the other pulses you do want to do at the same time and compare the strength between the two. Um, when you're at the extremities, we can do our hand grasp and push pulls and see how strong they are and look at the equality. So are they weaker on the left? Are they... Strong on both, or are they weak on both? What's going on with that? So I just think it's easier when you're already on those those hands, you just quick get that hand grasp push pull. All right, abdomen. Already covered this a little bit when we were going over this the slide on the auscultation. Um, so 
we'll look at a picture with the diagram of the quadrants. So normal, 5 to 30. Hypo is less than that. Hyper is more than that. And silent or absent is going to be nothing. Um, now, we're also going to be looking for distension, tenderness when we palpate. And we're going to be listening for five minutes if they're absent in each quadrant, which I already covered. So with the abdomen, there is an order of assessment technique. And this is an absolute must. You must memorize this order. It's going to be inspect, auscultate, percuss, and palpate. That is the order of the abdomen. There is no way around that. You have to do it that way. Okay, so here's the picture of the quadrant. We usually use the navel and then the midline as the two lines, so the belly button. Um, and remember, the order goes the right lower, right upper, left upper, left lower, and you kind of can see that pattern here in this slide, what's going on. So a normal abdominal assessment would be abdomen soft, non-tender, round, non-distended, bowel sounds present in all four quadrants. That would be a good way of phrasing a normal one, or a normal, sorry, a normal abdominal assessment. Okay, so reviewing the genitalia, anus, and rectum. Now, unless there's a specific complaint in that area, you don't, for every patient, have to visually assess them. Now, if you're doing peri care, there you can get your assessment in. Um, so that would be great. Or assisting with toileting. Ask the patient if there's any problems with that area. And if there are, you may end up needing to assess that at that point in time. But we're gonna be looking for, you know, rashes, discharge, odors, anything abnormal, lesions, anything going on like that. Now, here's where we're gonna ask, where's your last, when's your last bowel movement? What does it look like? How often do you normally go? Any burning with urination? Any frequency at night? Any hematuria or blood in your urine? Um, questions like that. So please review your book for all that terminology with the GUGI system. Systematic way to perform an assessment. So a side note, you really you want to get into a technique and keep with that way. So keep a structure and be very methodical about it. I mean, even now for myself, if a patient asks me something and I go out of my structure or how I normally do the head to toe assessment, I usually end up forgetting something and having to come back. So um, we really want to start from head to toe and you don't want to go head, feet, neck, femoral, like just head to toe. Also, we're going to be um, getting info about all these parts. So ask about rest, activity, nutrition, fluids, electrolytes. Um, I'm going to be covering all of these factors. Positioning and draping. Our last chapter, we went over positioning of the patient. So please review those positionings, but make sure you drape the areas you're not using for modesty. So remember, supine was on the spine, um, lithotomy was that with, was the feet up in the stirrups, knee to chest, lateral sims are prone. For the most part, we're going to have our patients supine, possibly lateral, depending. Um, they could be sitting up as well. Don't forget to provide for privacy as well. All right, bladder should be emptied. Um, have the patient put on an examination gown. Now, they may already be in it. Depends on where you work. Have the necessary equipment. Um, the equipment's going to depend on what examination we're doing. Neurocheck. Um, we're going to cover this real quick here. So, all right, when you go in and get your two patient identifiers, name and date of birth, that is not a neuro assessment. That is person. So if they know name and date of birth, they are alert to person. So do not forget about asking them where they are. What day is it or what time is it or what month? Kind of depends on the situation, but we need to see person, place, and time. And situation, why are you here? Okay, so please do not go and say what's your name and date of birth and why are you here. That is not a neuro assessment. I need all four parts, person, place, time, and situation. And honestly, 
that should be one of the first things you are doing when you walk into that room. It's real quick, have it done with. Because here's another thing, if you don't know if they're alert and oriented times four, or three even, how do you know what they're telling you is accurate? So we kind of need to gauge what their net neuro system is, what's going on there. Um, so we already talked about the Perla. We also are going to look at the cardinal fields, the, ga the cardinal gazes. Um, we'll go over that in class. And now Glasgow Coma Scale, we're, we're not going over this with you, but it is used in some hospitals to, to score a neurological exam. So you may see that come up again when you do your neuro. Do not forget about your teaching, patient and family teaching. Um, it's going to depend on their age, developmental level, and what's going on with the patient as to what teaching you're going to be doing with your patient. We're also going to be assessing for educational deficits. So are there areas that they need to know more about, like drinking more fluids, why, um, monitoring changes in urine, anything like that. Abbreviations, so you need to know abbreviations. There's more, we go over them in class as they come up. Um, but HS is at night, ADL, activities of daily living. Up at lib would be up, uh, tolerated, up whenever they want, out of bed. FX is fracture. WNL, within normal limits. Be careful with this because if you're gonna use it, it means the definition of normal has to be defined. And you have to be within that. That doesn't mean just you're normal. That means the facility says this is normal and you're saying, yes, the patient fits this criteria. AC is before meals. CTA, clear to auscultation. And PC is after meals. So there's a lot more and um, you'll pick them up as we go through. I suggest honestly taking notes on them when you see them because it's going to be easier to start remembering. Vocab. These are just a couple words that were in this slide. There is a ton of vocab. I highly suggest with this physical examination that you, you make index cards or you definitely know and learn your vocab. Now, when I say that, I mean don't be able to tell me word for word what the book says or what Google says. Just put it in your own words because you have to understand it because when you're given a question with it, and if you can't put it in your own words and you don't know what it actually means, you're going to really struggle with that question. So this is the end of this chapter. Um, please still read the book. And this is just going to take a lot of practice and time with getting used to this physical examination and all the terminology that comes with it. So thank you very much for listening and I will see you soon.